Ten years, two directors, and multiple engines later, we finally have Final Fantasy XV, a game which introduces massive changes to the long-running series, while offering one of the most technically accomplished presentations to come out of the Japanese studio in quite some time. This is a game that takes advantage of a huge number of advanced modern techniques to deliver a beautifully cohesive world of epic proportions, and today that's exactly what we're going to highlight. Welcome to the world of Final Fantasy XV. At its core, Final Fantasy XV was created using the in-house Luminous Studio, a powerful engine and suite of tools which helps deliver the visuals you see here. The toolset has been expanded and evolved alongside the creation of the game, and the end results are nothing short of amazing. The engine is capable of delivering massive, seamless maps with a high density of detail, while still delivering complex interactions on a micro scale. There are limitations and flaws to contend with, of course, but the overall package is truly something special. One of the most impressive accomplishments here then, both technically and artistically, is the usage of lighting. The physically based shading and global illumination techniques on display here help create dramatic and realistic scenes for you to explore. Real-time global illumination is of course rather expensive, but at the same time baked GI data requires loads of storage as well. So the solution here is actually mixed, as it makes use of both dynamic and static data. This hybrid approach makes use of a local probe system, and the implementation here enables highly realistic lighting, indoors, outdoors, and at any time of the day. The all-important specular reflections then are handled using a mix of real-time and baked elements as well. We've seen various takes in simulating global illumination this generation, but the implementation here stands at the top. Materials and surfaces are also uniquely detailed, everything from the expected skin with its subsurface scattering enabling realistic light penetration, to the beautiful paint finish on the regalia. The properties of everything are taken into account here, and it looks quite nice. All of these things can also become wet, and with the in-house shaders here used to create realistic trickling water, puddles, and ripples, everything looks quite realistic whether it's dry or wet. Final Fantasy XV also makes extensive use of volumetric lighting to display things such as torch lights used in dark environments, or to depict things such as fog. Then we have contact shadows which were created using a custom screen space ambient occlusion technique along with ambient occlusion spheres which are attached to elements such as the player characters and foliage. The implementation is quite good all around and artifacts are kept to a minimum. The game also makes use of real-time shadows throughout, with flashlights even being able to cast shadows when in dark environments. And while the global shadows used across the world do look very nice up close and are well filtered, there is unfortunately an issue with shadow drawing, which occurs relatively near the camera at times, which can appear a little bit jarring but it's the maps themselves that really shine here. They are remarkably detailed with a tremendous sense of scale. The level of detail system then is used here to effectively smooth the drawing in of details such as plants in such a way that it doesn't stick out too much. You can definitely see where the detail ends, but Poppin is not overly distracting here and is a big step up from earlier builds such as the 2015 demo. And while the open terrain is certainly impressive to behold, it's actually the city environments that impress above all else. This early location you visit in the game, for instance, absolutely wowed me with its geometric density and lighting quality. It finally feels as if the team was successful in delivering something resembling the pre-rendered CGI present in older Square products. And all of this can be accessed without running into an extra loading screen. The first time you visit a city like this, for instance, you're simply driving through a tunnel before being presented with this beautiful locale. You can approach from the other side as well without the need of a tunnel, I should note. The data streaming here is certainly effective. Of course, presenting all of this detail without significant shimmering does require a robust temporal anti-aliasing solution, and in this case, the selected AA method is pretty effective at removing those artifacts. 
but at the same time it's a very aggressive solution which does result in a rather blurry looking game across all platforms. Which then brings us to one of the first comparison points, resolution. Until now everything I've mentioned is present in all versions of the game, though there are some tweaks to the level of detail system when you play on a PS4 Pro in the high mode. But between the three consoles there is a noticeable difference in resolution depending on which one you're using. Starting at the top, the PS4 Pro offers two modes for players that I have discussed before, the high and light modes. High utilizes checkerboarding to reach 3200 by 1800 while the light mode sits at 1080p. The base PS4 seems to use a dynamic resolution which maxes out at 1080p but can drop closer to 900p in certain situations, while Xbox One tops out at 900p and can drop just above 720p. I do believe that this softness is something that the players have taken issue with, but it's ultimately a matter of preference I feel, and it doesn't really distract from the experience, at least for me. I do think it's a significant improvement over the rather pixelated 2015 demo. But once you start playing the game, another thing really starts to jump out. The animation and physics. Final Fantasy XV makes use of some of the most intricate in-game animation I've seen to date. Complex animation layering and inverse kinematics are used in many ways across each character. You can really feel that here when you start running down a slope and you can see the way the characters translate their body weight and change the animation style based on this. It's very, very impressive looking. Characters will also focus their attention on objects and enemies in a realistic way. They can also react to external forces and generally behave in a somewhat natural fashion. Battles do manage to look surprisingly convincing in motion, despite the fact that Noctis can partake in physics divine actions such as this, but it all comes together really well in the end. But what really impressed me about the animation and the engine in general here is how the game is able to scale up the size of scenes. This massive boss battle here, for instance, has the scale of something like God of War 3, and the fact that this is integrated right into their massive open world engine game without any additional loading screens or anything, it's pretty impressive to see. I should also mention the cutscenes themselves, which are really well presented here for the most part, and the game does make use of performance capture for many of them. The results are generally excellent during all these major cutscenes, and I say major because there are some flaws that pop up at certain points. Basically, the conversation sequences that can occur during normal gameplay tend to look somewhat lower quality overall with poor expressions and some rather unimpressive lip sync. It really stands out against the otherwise incredible animation work in this game. The character models themselves though are of course very detailed with a huge amount of effort poured into the hair specifically. While there are visible artifacts present, such as dithering, the hair simulation is of an incredibly high quality throughout, with the hair moving and animating in an incredibly realistic way as you move around through the world. This of course applies to other things such as cloth, which you can see as you run around as well. Another feature worth mentioning then is the particle system. Whether we're talking about particles of magic used during combat or huge plumes of smoke, it all looks really nice in motion, and it feels very thick and full. It adds a lot to the cutscenes and gameplay alike, and is certainly a key ingredient in making the battle shine. So at this point, I've touched on many of the cool and impressive features that I've found throughout the game, and of course there are more things that you could look at here. This is a very dense experience, but there are a few drawbacks or visual nitpicks I have to mention here as well. For instance, one thing that really bothered me is the way the screen space reflections are used in the game. When you're near a body of water, the reflections are aggressively culled along the right and left side of the screen, and it can look a little jarring at times. I also feel like the water shader too is somewhat disappointing here, and is actually a step down from the demo version that was released in 2015. While it can look good in certain scenes, the bodies of water at least early on, are definitely a weak point in the game. Texture filtering is of course another major issue. On PS4, Xbox One, and the PS4 Pro in light mode, the filtering is set to a very low level, which can seriously compromise texture detail in many scenes. Now this problem is fixed on the PS4 Pro when using the high mode of course, but 
the awful frame pacing in this mode makes it difficult to appreciate there. At least if you're sensitive to those issues, but that's in another video. While we're on the subject of the different consoles again, I did want to make sure and point out that outside of resolution, you do get a very, very similar experience in the PS4, Xbox One, and the Pro. When using the aforementioned high mode on the Pro, of course, you do get that improved LOD draw distance, better image quality, and improved texture filtering, but everything else appears to be virtually identical here. Still, it's likely that most players will be experiencing the game on either a regular PS4 or on an Xbox One. You can see then that the two versions do look pretty much identical in terms of asset and lighting quality. Things like level of detail drawing and texture filtering are also the same here, but there is actually a difference in terms of image quality due to the resolution differences. As I mentioned in my performance videos then, selecting the optimal version of the game is going to depend somewhat upon your thoughts on the various flaws here. Bad frame pacing remains an issue on PlayStation 4 and the PS4 Pro when using the high quality mode, but image quality is pretty good across the board if a bit blurry due to the strong temporal anti-aliasing here. On the flip side, of course, the image quality on Xbox One is a noticeable step down due to the lower resolution combined with the very strong temporal anti-aliasing. The mix of the adaptive resolution and the anti-aliasing solution here can definitely sometimes result in some oddities like you can see here along the edges in this shot. But there are no frame pacing issues here and the game feels quite smooth most of the time. Which version you should play will depend upon which consoles you own and which issues you find most distracting. In the end, I've been playing primarily on the PS4 Pro using the light mode since it offers a good mix of image quality without frame pacing issues during gameplay. Ultimately though, whichever platform you decide to play the game on, it's an absolutely beautiful open world experience with some of the most stunning lighting and animation in the business. I do think this is a return to form for Square Enix, but the future of the game and this engine is certainly something interesting. Despite the huge amount of effort poured into Luminous Studio over the years, Final Fantasy XV is currently the only real game designed to make use of it. Titles like Kingdom Hearts 3, which were originally going to use Luminous, were moved over to Unreal Engine 4 instead, which of course is an incredible engine. While Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is being developed primarily by CyberConnect2, also makes use of Epic's engine. It would be a real shame for all of this work to be used with just one title. Unlike the last generation Crystal Tools, for instance, which was too specialized to be useful in other games, I feel like Luminous Studio has a lot of potential and could have a bright future. At the very least, Final Fantasy XV itself seems ripe for a PC port, as it should scale beautifully on modern PCs, and the engine itself was designed to work well on the platform from the very beginning. If we're lucky, perhaps sometime in 2017 we'll actually see just that. But we've come to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed this brief look at some of the features and techniques being used in the game, and perhaps developed an appreciation for what the development team has accomplished here. But if you enjoyed this video then, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter. And until next time, this is John signing off.